It is my great honor to be the first to welcome you all formally to Mi'kmaq territory. Tonight, incomplete. Why some people say a high school's new territorial acknowledgement doesn't go far enough. It's a surprise, I think, to a lot of people. She is their second executive director. She brings to a total 21 people now that have left. Grandchildren Over and out, and another high-profile resignation each at the support. National Inquiry into Missing and Murder Indigenous Women and um, Girls. You know. And vocal success, a new Canadian music competition launches a Six Nations artist into the big time. Good evening, I'm Rick Harp. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin tonight in Halifax, where the regional school board has made land acknowledgments mandatory in all of its schools. Only the third board to do so in all of Canada. But as APTN's Justin Brake reports, there's been pressure from the province to rework the wording. The land acknowledgments official wording does not include a term used by most Mi'kmaq to describe a key part of history, unseated. Jessica Rose is the school board's Mi'kmaq representative. She said it was the board's lawyers and the provincial government who directed the school board not to use unseated in the land acknowledgement, which is now heard by upward of 48,000 students each morning. It was actually the Office of Aboriginal Affairs that directed us kind of away from it um, to start out anyway and as well as our, our lawyers just because and they told us there wouldn't be any legal implications but just because the word is so heavy and without the education a lot of people don't understand what the word is. Meanwhile others are pushing for the terms inclusion. It is my great honor to be the first to welcome you all formally to Mi'kmaq territory the unceded traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. On Wednesday, Rebecca Moore read the inaugural land acknowledgement at her former junior high school in Halifax. With the knowledge that it is unceded Mi'kmaq territory, because that's something that's still being challenged by, you know, like the greater population of Canada. And um, so they will know the facts and it's a great education opportunity and that's what this is really about. The school's principal, Robert McMillan, said it's important his students know the truth about where they live and learn. So our hope is the more that we get the message out there that we are actually on traditional unceded lands of Indigenous peoples, the more they hear that, I'm hopeful that the more they will appreciate our history and understand what has happened uh, to the Indigenous peoples of Canada. McMillan said he will bring his concern over the omission of the term unceded to the school board. Because it's an important part of the whole reconciliation process because the lands do belong to Indigenous people and they haven't been taken, we haven't taken it from them, they still own it and we need to acknowledge that. Moore said the unceded acknowledgement is a necessary step toward reconciliation. This is the true spirit of peace and friendship and reconciliation and, and this school has done an excellent job reconciling with me, one of its Indigenous students. APTN contacted Nova Scotia Premier Stephen McNeil's office Thursday. In 2013, McNeil appointed himself Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. He declined to comment for the story. Rose said the school board's decision to omit the word unseated from the land acknowledgement is not set in stone and that the board could review its decision at a future meeting. Justin Brake, APTN National News, unceded Mi'kmaq territory. And joining us with a little bit more on that story from Halifax is APTN's Justin Brake. Justin, did the Premier's office say why it declined to comment on this? Well, I spoke with the Premier's press secretary, David Jackson, today. He said the Department of Aboriginal Affairs uh, isn't aware of who said what to whom in terms of uh, communication to the school board. Uh, they said they're going to look into it, but in the, in the meantime, the Premier couldn't offer a comment on the situation. I did ask uh, the, the press secretary if, what the Premier, if he could comment just on the idea of uh, unceded uh, territory and uh, whether he could say whether or not he disputes that uh, 
the, the political jurisdiction he operates is on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Uh, the press secretary again said that the premier couldn't offer any comment on that today. It's not the latest incident of a Canadian uh, politician at the federal, municipal or provincial level uh, in recent times uh, being reluctant to or refusing to acknowledge that, uh, the, that this is on, that, that we are on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Just the other night, Tuesday, uh, Tr Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was in Lower Sackville. And following a Mi'kmaq land acknowledgement there, he took to the floor and thanked the two, uh, the two men, including an elder who gave the land acknowledgement. And Trudeau himself acknowledged that he was on the traditional land of the Mi'kmaq, but did not acknowledge uh, that he was on unceded Mi'kmaq land, despite the fact that that word was included in that land acknowledgement. And of course, last summer, uh, at an Indigenous ceremony held here in Halifax uh, at the Edward Cornwallis statue, the uh, controversial founder of Halifax who uh, issued uh, a bounty on Mi'kmaq scalps, mm. uh, the, sta the statue where there was a ceremony being led, uh, the mayor of Halifax, Mike Savage, uh, addressed the crowd and was acknowledging that he was on Mi'kmaq territory. The crowd actually cut him off and pressured him to say the word. They said, say it, say it, say it. And the mayor finally acknowledged publicly that uh, Halifax is on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. So it remains to be seen whether or not Premier Stephen McNeil will acknowledge that the province of Nova Scotia is on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. Uh, we, they said, uh, we said that AP10 would be following up with them soon. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you. Moving to the other side of the country now, where we bring you an update on a story we brought you yesterday about a protest camp set up outside of Kinder Morgan's tank farm in Burnaby, B.C. As APTN's Tina House reports, last night saw things take a violent turn. This Facebook Live video shows RCMP officers coming in force and storming their way into the trailer, known as Camp Cloud. They arrested two elderly women inside. This is what Camp Cloud looks like today. Witnesses say police used a battering ram to open the trailer door, destroying it. Uni Urchin, who was on top of the roof yesterday, preventing officers from towing the trailer, says she wasn't arrested after the police cut a deal. They promised that if she came down, they would not remove the trailer. started to just go ahead in here and smash it with this big giant black pipe from what I can see above. And, um, and so it's now um, ripped our door apart. They've smashed the window and the, the, the handle here, so we're not able to close it. Suit Loot is from the Squamish Nation, and she witnessed the takedown. It felt very, very violent. We had some youth here sitting and uh, witnessing what went down. The two unidentified women that were in the trailer were taken away by RCMP, but not charged. Ultimately, they were released within an hour. I'm against Kinder Morgan myself. Water's sacred, water's life. The pipelines do not need to go in. It's all about money. Corporations making money, not BC, not the uh, people up here, but the corporations from Houston, from Texas. Today, RCMP are gone. We requested an interview from Kinder Morgan and the RCMP, but both have not responded. A few more people have arrived today to support the activists. Tina House, APTN National News, Burnaby. We invite you to comment on this or any other story you see on the broadcast. Here's how to contact us. Send an email to news at aptn.ca, like our APTN National News Facebook page. Follow us on Twitter, APTN News is our handle, or go to our website, aptnnews.ca. There has been yet another high-profile departure at the National Inquiry. The news broke as the staff is halfway into a team-building exercise. Kathleen Martins is here now with the latest. So Kathleen, big news. We've just learned today that the executive director 
has stepped down. What do we know about that so far? Yeah, Debbie Reed, she came in in October. She was a, touted as somewhat of a savior. She was going to uh, get a firm grip on some of the management issues that were going on there, a lot of resignations. Uh, she came in a little bit heavy-handed, people felt, a kind of bull in a china shop. Uh, she fired some people. Uh, other people left because they didn't like that she fired some people, so it took a little while for the waters to calm down. They sort of did November, and then last month we heard a bit of a blip again where she publicly contradicted a commissioner, talking about maybe would there be a hearing in Montreal or not. But uh, it's a surprise, I think, to a lot of people. She is their second executive director. She brings to a total 21 people now that have left. What's your sense of why there's such turnover? Yeah, like, like people always have to point to management, right? Somebody has to wear it. Somebody's responsibility. Uh, that would be the chief commissioner, Marion Buller. Uh, we have asked her before on camera. She has said that people leave for personal reasons. And uh, she's not going to stand in anybody's way. She has treated it very um, professionally and sort of impersonally. So we don't really know. Other than one person who left saying they did not like the way the new executive director, Debbie Reed, had uh, been talking about staff, you know, in sort of internally. They didn't like uh, her attitude and didn't feel she was supporting staff, so they quit. So very quickly now, where does the inquiry go from here? Yeah, they've got a hearing uh, scheduled for three days in Yellowknife at the end of the month where we're going to be asking about what are they going to do now that they don't have an executive director. And apparently they're supposed to be maybe or maybe not asking for an extension. So lots of things still in the air, never mind just losing an executive director. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Well, time to take a break here on the program. When we come back, we'll talk to you about uh, new changes to the quota on hunting polar bears. Please stay tuned. Right now, your first weather update. Hello, I'm Todd Lamaran, and here's what's coming up on Nation to Nation. Yesterday, Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodall announced big dollars for Indigenous police services. Anishinaabe Asking Nation Deputy Grand Chief Derek Fox tells me if it's enough to modernize their police force. As well, a court case in Northern Ontario seeks to substantially increase the annual treaty payment, which is currently just $4. And on Monday, the Supreme Court of Canada is hearing a duty to consult case. Before government passes a law, should First Nations be consulted? It's coming up right after the national news. Cloudy and six in St. John's, rain and 10 in Fredericton. In Nuktuak, snow and minus 27, Nain minus 12 in snow. Valdor, a sunny minus 14, a cloudy nine in Gas Bay. Sarnia, mostly cloudy, zero Ottawa, snow and eight. Sioux Lookout, cloudy, minus 22. Timmins, sunny and minus 21. Thompson, minus 23 and sun. Churchill, sun and minus 24. Gimli Harbor, a sunny, minus 19. Barrens River, a bit of cloud and minus 22. Saskatoon, a sunny, minus 24. Yorkton, a sunny, minus 23. Uranium City, minus 27 and sun. Larange, sun and minus 25. And welcome back to the newscast. The limits on the polar bear hunt appear to be changing. In the Baffin Bay region, the quota is going up. Meanwhile, another region is debating whether more bears should be harvested there. The latest news comes from western Hudson Bay, a region that spans Churchill, Manitoba, through to Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. Last year, the allowable harvest was increased. Nunavut Tungavik, the land claim body, wants the quota held at the limit of 34. But the government of Nunavut wants the old quota back, 28 every year. And the Kavalik Wildlife Board wants to allow up to 45 polar bears a year. The Nunavut Wildlife Management Board gets to make the ultimate decision with the approval of the territory's environment minister. The season opens this July 1st. Starting a small business can be daunting, but it can also be a labor of love. Beverly Andrews now with the story of a new makeup line that embodies both qualities. 
An indigenous-owned cosmetic company doesn't just want to help its customers look good, but to give back, too. Our goal as a company was 10% of profit, so that 10% of profits will be going to the First Nation Family and Child Caring Society uh, in February or March. However, again, in 2017, Cheekbone Beauty as a business has not made any profits. So how I've gone about doing that is the profits that if we were a company that was completely in the black at this time. Jen Harper, the founder and CEO of Cheekbone Beauty, worked over the past several years to develop an Indigenous-owned premium makeup line made in Canada from high quality ingredients. The um, liquid lipsticks, which is sort of the line that I'm super proud about, um, are all named after strong, inspiring, empowering Indigenous women. There is a shade named after child welfare advocate Cindy Blackstock and a pretty red named for Autumn Peltier, a 13-year-old water protector who was recently nominated for the Children's International Peace Award. The line also includes lip gloss, brow gel, contour, and highlighting kits. We're a cosmetics brand, so if you were to walk into Sephora, we were, we're a high-quality premium makeup brand, just like one of the brands you would see on the shelf there. It takes time to build a business. Most do not make money in the first few years. It's small steps along the way to build success. Every single day, what are you doing today that's going to make you better for the next day, than the next day after that, then the next day after that, then the next week, month, year, and so on. So it's all the individual things that we're doing on a daily basis. Cheekbone products are currently available online. Beverly Andrews, APTN National News, St. Catharines, Ontario. 34 years. That's how long Philip Talio has been in jail. He's there because of a heinous crime, the rape and murder of toddler Delavina Mack. A crime Talio says he never actually committed. Here now, a preview of Rob Smith's APTN Investigates episode, A Case for Innocence. Early on an April morning in 1983, Delavina Mack was raped and killed in her home in Bella Coola, British Columbia. She was just 22 months old. 17-year-old Philip Talio was convicted of her murder. Despite a guilty plea, Talio insists he's innocent. He's now spent over three decades in prison. I've always believed he was innocent. Somebody's lived in the community all these years and had left Philip sit behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. No conscience? Yeah. Nothing. Now newly discovered evidence is raising doubts Philip Talio committed the horrible crime. It is a miscarriage of justice. Um, that's what we found. Did you kill Del Mar? Do you want me to believe you? When we return here on APTN National News, a Six Nations singer earned some buzz at a music competition. Please stay with us. Lots of sun in northern Alberta, high level, minus 28. Minus 23 and sunny in Edmonton, partly cloudy, minus 16 in Lethbridge. Port Hardy, rain and 5. Quinell, minus 15, mostly cloudy. Fort Nelson, minus 28 and sun. Prince George, mostly cloudy, minus 16. Beaver Creek, minus 32 and sun. Old Crow, minus 39 and sun. Ray Lakes, a sunny minus 29. Fort Liard, minus 30 and sun. Inuvik, minus 27 and sun. Colville Lake, minus 33 and sun. Baker Lake, partly cloudy, minus 23. Repulse Bay, minus 26 and sun. Clyde River, mostly cloudy, minus 25. Cape Dorset, partly cloudy, minus 26.
And before we leave you tonight, a new Canadian music competition show hit the airwaves last night. It's called The Launch, and it premiered on CTV. The program hopes to help kickstart the careers of emerging artists. And the winner of the first episode, Six Nations artist Logan Statz. First up, I gotta say that I've been completely. Six episodes have incredible artists start to finish. And when I first met Logan, when he first stepped onto the audition stage, I was taken. And, you know, there's just a presence about him. You can feel that, you know, he, you can feel his struggle. You can feel that hurt in his voice. And you can feel also a redemption. And when you can find those kind of feelings, and they, they can emote and make you feel something. Where I was kind of struggling with the song and playing guitar at the same time, and, and she kind of just told me, put the guitar down, you know, focus on the vocals and focus on the phrasing. And that was, that was really helpful. And then, of course, um, the moment where I'm in the studio and I'm struggling to kind of find my pocket, um, when Scott kind of tells me to take a breath and slow down and, and sing. Now, as I understand it, Stats beat out two other artists with his song, The Lucky Ones. Now, he's no stranger to the music scene. He has shared the stage with other Indigenous artists, including Buffy St. Marie and Keith Sokola of Indian Car fame. And following his win, he had performed it live for the very first time. All right, you're watching APTN National News. Thanks for watching us. That's it for us today. We'll see you all again tomorrow. Take care.